All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Science Week and welcome to Beyond the Lab, uh, a series of webinars where we explore the STEM career journeys of IMNIS catalysts. Beyond the Lab is an exciting collaboration between two of ATSI's STEM Career Pathways initiatives, the Industry Mentoring Network in STEM, known as IMNIS, and the STELLA program. My name is Sarah Crow, and I am the IMNIS program coordinator, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all online this morning. As we gather from around Australia, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands of which we meet. I'm joining you today from Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. So before we get into the session, uh, you will have seen it's being recorded. Beyond the Lab and all the talks in the Shape Your Future series will be available on the Stella YouTube channel for you to revisit at any time. Uh, there's also a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any questions, drop them in there and we'll get to them during the Q&A discussion after we've heard from our catalysts. Uh, finally, you're going to be sent a feedback form after the session to the email that you registered with. Uh, so please let us know what went well and what you'd like to see in the series next year. So today you're going to be hearing about the STEM career journeys of two IMNIS catalysts. So IMNIS Catalyst is a year-long ambassadorship program where competitively selected IMNIS alumni are provided with training and speaking opportunities, such as this one, to share their STEM career journeys with a broader audience. It's my pleasure today to introduce you to Dr. Beatrice Chu and Tian Ni. So we'll start off uh, presenting first today is Beatrice. Uh, Beatrice is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Newcastle. So take it away. Hi everyone. Um, just gonna share my screen now. Uh, cool, can everyone see my slides? Awesome. So yeah, hi, my name's uh, Beatrice, uh, Dr. Beatrice Chu. Um, and I guess by way of introduction, I will tell you a bit about my story, my career path from high school to where I am now. So in high school, very, very long time ago, um, yeah, I was really, I guess I didn't really start with um, a huge love of science. I was more of a literature slash philosophy slash arty slash theater kid. Um, I had I dug up a couple of pictures from the archives. Here's me as Bellatrix Lestrange, and here's me as perhaps uh, a bit more of a, an obscure reference. This is Eowyn from Lord of the Rings. So, you know, I wasn't, when I finished high school, I wasn't 100% sure whether I wanted to do STEM as a career or whether I wanted to go into the humanities. And so that was reflected in the first bachelor that I chose, which was um, a Bachelor of Science Art. So split the difference, right? Um, so I did a little, I did um, chemistry and biology um, in my science degree. And I think I did bioethics and another and a language in my arts degree. But this is where one of my first sort of pivotal career uh, choices was made. Um, and I owe it to this man right here. His name is uh, Dr. Chris Thompson. And he was my very first organic chemistry lecturer. And I remember him because he brought in this vat of liquid nitrogen to teach us gas laws. And it was through his lectures, his really um, you know, practical, a way of teaching that I started to really love both chemistry and, um, you know, and, and consider a career in it. Um, and I guess I also really loved biology and through the merging of chemistry, biology, and a desire to have some kind of practical application at the intersection of the two, I decided to transfer from this Bachelor of um, Science and Arts into a Bachelor of Pharmaceutical Sciences um, with honors. Because at that point, I sort of realized, okay, you know, I like I like biology, I like chemistry, um, and I really enjoy asking a lot of questions about it. Um, and so I thought research was the best, uh, you know, way to to uh, explore all of that. 
Um, so this is this is my campus. This is Monash University, the Parkville campus, which um, is in the city in Melbourne. A um, couple of happy snaps of a squash club that I started up there. Um, and this is me competing in three minute thesis. So it's sort of a nice little loop back to my uh, love of like, you know, literature and like language and communication. Um, and that's when I, and after, sorry, so after I finished my bachelor, I went on to do a PhD in medicinal chemistry, and that's where I competed in three minute thesis also at the, at the Monash Parkville campus. Um, after I finished my PhD, I went on to do a postdoc, um, and I moved states to do so. So now I am in uh, New South Wales at the University of Newcastle, working with Professor Adam McCluskey. Um, I love it here. I get to put on, you know, tons of cool reactions. Uh, this one sec. This is one that I did earlier in the year. Hope the video works. Um, it's a it's uh, an organic chemistry reaction. I just liked it because it was beautiful and, you know, it looks like a snow globe. So I get to put on all these cool reactions. I get to present my work to other like-minded people at conferences. Um, and yeah, that's that's where I got up to. So this is where I am presently. I'll tell you a little bit about the work that I do. So I am a medicinal chemist by training. It is, um, as I've mentioned, an intersection between biology and chemistry in a very applied way. Um, and specifically in my postdoctoral studies, I am looking at this process called endocytosis, which is basically the way in which things get in and out of the cell. In particular, um, the way the cell, the, the way the cell wall sort of comes into itself, um, there's a protein that's involved in cleaving this uh, vesicle here, which is called dynamin. So dynamin effectively wraps around um, the cell wall to pinch off that vesicle. And if you inhibit this protein, then you can actually, uh, it actually has beneficial effects in um, a range of diseases. Uh, so I use my chemistry knowledge, I make compounds that look like this little guy down here, and I try to target dynamin to inhibit its activity. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it for me. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that, Beatrice. Um, fascinating to hear about um, that you now uh, work with sort of chemicals and chemical reactions and things for a living. It must be must be fun uh, recreating all of those uh, science experiments and reactions. Like uh, certainly, certainly, I know in high school I made uh, volcanoes and things using chemical reactions. So that must be super fun to do that uh, as a day job. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no exploding things though, unfortunately. No. Nah. Dang it. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> that, that'll, that'll be the next one, I'm sure. All righty. So uh, thank you so much for that, Beatrice. We, I would like to introduce our second catalyst for today, uh, Tan. So Tan is currently completing her PhD at the University of Melbourne. So take it away, Tan. Hello. Hi, folks. So my name is Tian. I'm assuming you can all hear me, given that no one has interested me yet. So just a little bit of introduction about what I'm currently doing before I get into how I got here. I'm, as Sarah mentioned, a final year PhD student at the University of Melbourne, where I'm looking at the effects of gender affirming hormone therapy for transgender ad adolescents and adults on their bone health using a mouse model. So essentially, I give mice hormones, and then I look at what happens to their bones. Then I give talks, make videos, and write papers about it. I'm also a business development intern at the University of Melbourne's Research Innovation and Commercialization team, where we help university researchers take their research and inventions and bring it to the public, whether that's through startup companies, establishing industry contacts, patents, et cetera. Now, I am also moonlighting as a music teacher. So on the side, I teach piano, violin, and music theory, and I also used to conduct a few choirs. And shameless plug here, this is my YouTube channel where I posted a lot of pandemic covers because what else does a musician do during a pandemic? Now, you might be wondering, how did I get here? Why am I doing two jobs at once? And why is there a massive Canadian flag there? 
So if you haven't guessed already, I was raised in Canada. I did my high school and my undergraduate years there. I went to a public high school and I really enjoyed my science classes there. Chemistry, biology, physics, math, the typical science stuff. Turns out setting things on fire is really, really fun. I even did a tiny research project in chemistry where I was trying to see if air fresheners would make your paint last longer because that's what I was kind of seeing on TV ads at that point. And I was like, maybe I need to check if they're, those TV ads are actually true or not. Um, yeah. It probably also helped that most of my classmates were also nerds, which made classes always fun. And you can see how proud we were of the massive triglyceride model we made. And on the music side of things, I've already been playing piano for a number of years during high school, but high school was really when it exposed me to a wide variety of styles beyond just the classical I was taught. So I played in multiple high school musical pit bands there as lead keyboard, and I also started branching out into the other instruments because I was just interested in them. And I think that's a key theme for me, an interest and curiosity for things in general. So in undergraduate studies at the University of Toronto, I had the opportunity to explore a lot of my academic interests on a global scale. I took my science courses, yes, but I also actually studied Shakespeare in England amongst other fun interests and virtual brownie points to whoever can name the play, this soliloquy and this beautiful picture my professor drew is based on. I was fortunate enough to also be able to apply my learnings through ecology courses in Ecuador and a CSI style course where we dissected a beluga to figure out the cause of death. Um, University of Toronto also had multiple paid research projects for undergraduate students. So here I was in Finland looking after research calves, one of whom I attempted to name Orochimaru after an anime character, yes. And also I did an undergraduate thesis in mice models of brain hemorrhaging, where I was presenting here. Of course, it wasn't all fun and glamorous. I did a lot of dirty work as well when I started out, such as washing flats for a plant genomics lab, and this stack was taller than I was, as well as shoveling poop at the farm, which I will spare you the image of. Essentially, when I saw an opportunity, I took it. And in terms of the creative outlet stuff, I took it a little bit easier, meaning I was only involved in two groups instead of like six. I did, however, have the opportunity to lead and conduct a choir, which was quite interesting for me as I didn't actually have conducting or formal singing experience, but I took the opportunity and ran with it. I also did a lot of accompanying to keep my piano skills sharp. And I think one of the main takeaways from my undergraduate was that if I had an interest, I can create opportunities for myself. So after I graduated undergrad, I was still quite interested in like, and I still had a lot of curiosity for things and I wanted to learn more. So I applied around to a few grad schools and I got rejected from all of them on the first round. It's okay because I just kept looking. At the time, I was developing an interest in transgender health as I had a close friend who had questions about the effects of his transition on his body. And I didn't really know the answer. So I looked a little bit around on the internet for some research and turns out no one really knew the answer. So I emailed some professors around the world who were doing research in the field. One of them in Australia got back to me. I applied to the school and four years later, voila. Here I am presenting parts of my research at a national conference, literally taken two weeks ago. On the creative side of things, my leadership and performance experiences in undergrad translated really well to teaching and performing in the real world, quote unquote. So here's me with a bunch of students in the pre-COVID times, with, along with our other teachers. And one of the other many musical career highlights for me was singing with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra and Joe Hisaishi this man here, who composed the music to many Studio Ghibli films. I also recently participated in a cross-cultural concert fusing both Chinese and Western style music instruments, which was also a lot of fun. So now that I'm reaching the end of my grad school journey, you might be wondering what comes next? And that is an excellent question because the answer is, I don't really know. <laughs> But in the meantime, you can come to my PhD completion seminar talk if you want. Just scan the QR code there. And that's happening in two days at noon 
in other news, you can also follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter for any science news or my Instagram and YouTube for any music related news. And yeah, thanks. Fantastic, Jan. What a incredibly engaging presentation. Thank you so much for that. And congratulations on, um, well, congratulations in two days, I guess, on, <laughs> on, on presenting your PhD to the world. That is, I know that is a huge step. So um, yeah, that's amazing to see. All right, so now that we have heard from Tana Beatrice, we are going to open it up to a bit of a Q&A discussion. Uh, so uh, just a reminder to everyone um, joining us this morning that you can use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to submit a question. Um, I have a couple of ones here, but we would love to answer your questions as well. Uh, so I guess my, my first question uh, to the both of you is, um, what advice would you give your high school self? I'll start with you, Beatrice. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the advice I would give myself is not to try to overplan everything and to just lean into what makes you curious, what interests you at the time. You know, I, I, I think in high school, especially in the final years of high school, you tend to try to, you know, people are always telling you, okay, what do you want to do? Or like asking you, what do you want to do next? What, what do you want to do for your career? Um, and, you know, I, I don't know that I would have expected me to be here when I was in high school. So I think what helped me is just sort of just relaxing a little bit and just trusting my intuition. Um, and so that's what I would advise my high school self to do. I, I think that's fantastic advice. Um, certainly, yeah, all, all the time you're asked, you know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do? But um, I, I love the idea of yeah, following your curiosity because um, life has so many twists and turns. You, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, what about yourself, Chan? What would you tell your high school self? I think a lot of what I did in high school like the interests that I was still interested in carried over because I continued to feed my curiosity and interests in those kind of things. In high school, there was also a lot of things that I stopped doing once I got into university because I just lost interest. And I think that's one of the key things as well in that it's okay to lose interest in things and it's okay to change paths. Like my, actually my first major when I got into university was economics and half commerce and I was like oh I'm doing so hot in this economics class but I did really like biology so I think I'll just keep going here so it's just okay to change paths yeah yeah I can see Beatrice nodding along there as well <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, I was such a humanities kid, like when I was in high school, like my 18 year old self would be very surprised at where I ended up right now. Um, and yeah, I just I agree wholeheartedly with what you said, Tian. It's just, um, yeah, like giving yourself enough grace and trusting yourself enough to like change and like let it, you know, see what come see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm almost positive high school Sarah would be incredibly confused that I did not land a starring role on Neighbours and instead am running a STEM careers program. She would be, yeah, just out of this world being like, um, excuse me, ma'am, what's happened here? <laughs> All right, so we've got a question here from our audience. Uh, they want to know, is there um, a lot of leadership involved uh, in your jobs at the moment? So they're a little bit shy about being the leader. Have um, either of you sort of taken on a bit of a leadership role um, in your work, um, Tan or Be Beatrice? You can go first. Oh, it's up. Uh, sorry, Tian, maybe you go first because I went first last time. <laughs> okay, sure. So interestingly enough, in my research project, you're the person leading your own research project. So there is the leadership aspect there. However, it also depends on a lot on teamwork, right? So you're never really alone. Like I can rely on other people to help me. I can go ask my supervisors for help and all that. And then in terms of like teaching, yes, there is the aspect of leading in teaching, but 
um, because the like because I'm teaching in one on one situations, the leader of the team isn't really that big of a team. It's just you and your student. So it doesn't feel as stressful. When I first started out teaching, I was quite shy. I was like also uncomfortable suggesting you should really change this, et cetera, et cetera. But then the more you work with like just a student in a one-on-one -on -one situation, the more comfortable you get with taking the initiative and being like, okay, you're not doing this in the right way, but we can help you get there. And I think that kind of slow entry into like getting comfortable in yourself helped a lot in terms of getting my leadership skills up in other areas of my life as well. So yeah, it might not be comfortable at first, but um, the more you work on it, it, the better and the easier it gets. And also sometimes it's fine to just be shy and not talk. Like sometimes I just go to team meetings and I'll say nothing. And if there's nothing to say, that's okay too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, certainly there's uh, th th there's a lot of different types of leadership and sometimes people think of leadership as being you know the the Barack Obama's standing out giving you know we dare to hope speeches in front of crowds of you know thousands of people but you you can lead yeah you, you lead your own project kinds of things and uh, what about you Beatrice is there leadership involved in your role yeah so I guess I want to address like two parts to the there's like the question and there's the statement about you know being shy about being a leader so uh, yes like short answer there is a fair bit of leadership in what I am doing um, there was when I was a PhD student as Tian said you know you lead your own project and you sort of help mentor um, younger students that are in the lab or people you know other um, um, other other students as well um, and now as a as a postdoctoral researcher the responsibility increases right now I'm looking after like um, like a group <laughs> like in lieu of my my boss so I'm you know his eyes and ears basically in the lab however um, you know in, in terms of like I, again, when I was a PhD student, um, I was very shy. I'm still quite shy. I'm still fairly reserved. And, you know, probably I wouldn't consider myself a typical leader. But as Sarah and, you know, Tian have mentioned, there, there are so many leadership styles. Um, I think, unfortunately, there is a predominant style that gets shown um, and it doesn't fit all of us. I don't fit into that style. Um, but it is also, you know, perhaps there are things uh, that are involved in leadership that you don't necessarily work on. Like, you know, it's sort of like a muscle. And gradually over time, it is something that gets stronger and stronger and stronger, you know, if if you commit time to it. So, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I think it does. You're, you're right. Le leadership is, um, it's it's just like any other skill. It, it's something that needs to be practiced. And um, obviously, when when you're given a leadership opportunity, it do, most of the time, hopefully, it does start small. And so you do start with yeah, mentoring, mentoring, um, like on a one on one situation. Hopefully, you're not, you know, thrown in front of a 1000 people crowd and been like, all right, do a motivational speech, off you go. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for your insights on that. Um, oh, <coughs> excuse me. So um, another question I have for the both of you is, uh, what do you enjoy about what you do? And sort of what, what drew you into it? Um, I'll start with you, Beatrice. Yeah, sure. Um, it is what, in terms of what I enjoy about what I do, it is as simple as the idea that I am making something new that I can, um, that has some real world application. Um, I just like doing things like in a very tactile way. So, you know, I like doing things with my hands. I paint, I dance, like I like being, you know, very physical and I just love being in the lab. It makes me feel like I, 
you know, like a, a kid in a candy store, like being at Hogwarts, like in potions, you know, I just love the idea that I'm making something new. Um, and so, and, and my day to day feels a lot like, um, you know, doing crossword puzzles or Sudoku and just puzzles to solve. Um, and the second, what was the second part of the question? <laughs> what drew you into it? Mm, mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. I guess like I, well, yeah, I think I've, I've alluded to the fact that Chris Thompson really showed me the beauty of organic chemistry. Um, and I guess I, I mean, I remember when I was a very little kid, just sort of reading like encyclopedias about um, the human body and being fascinated by that. And that, you know, despite being very drawn to humanities, that was always sort of ticking away back in, in my head. Um, and then I sort of came full circle with that. Fantastic, what about you, Chan? So I think I mentioned, like also echoing the same thing as Beatrice, that curiosity that like always having something new happening. And I think the main thing with a PhD is that there is no right answer. No one really knows what is actually happening. We are creating essentially new knowledge out of what has been built before. And you are building that one brick or adding that one extra wall to like something to a house that you might never see the end of. But essentially it's a lot of that drive to know and curiosity and kind of and at the core of it like a drive to help people with knowledge I think is something that drove me to look into a PhD in the first place and then in terms of uh sorry what was the second question <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what what drew you into your field of research right yeah so it's just kind of not knowing what's there and then having someone who, you know, having a friend who was like, you're a biologist, you did, you studied a whole entire undergrad, like, what do you know? And I was like, eh, I don't know anything. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, but you know, there's other people that knows things. And then you look into it and it's like, everyone else was also like, eh, don't know. So it's kind of that, you want to know things so that you can, you know, answer questions. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, it's, <laughs> I, I find it funny, probably not very many people in the world could say they inspired a PhD project, um, but your, your friend is definitely one of them. Um, so something that the both of you touched on during your responses there that I'd like to um, sort of draw out a little bit more is that you were you're, you're both kind of talking about how science and and what you do is, is a bit like a puzzle and so you you spend your time trying trying to to solve it um most puzzles that you know sudoku's crosswords literal puzzles they they have a solution and I can, you know, if I'm stuck on a, on a crossword answer, I can, you know, flip the newspaper upside down and find the answer and feel, you know, satisfied. Given that you're discovering new knowledge and that there may not be an answer, how do the both of you deal with, like, does it cause frustration? And if so, how do you deal with the frustration that you might be going down a particular path and reach a dead end? Like, how do you kind of bounce back from that? Uh, I'll, I might, I might start. <laughs> um, short answer. Yes, <laughs> we get frustrated. I think almost everyone who does a PhD feels that, you know, or, or, or is even adjacent to science and research <laughs> feels the frustration of, um, because most of our job is, is, is failure, <laughs> if you like. It's, figuring out all these ways in which your hypothesis is not proven. <laughs> and so that comes, you know, it naturally comes with a lot of frustration, but there's a lot of, I don't know, there's a lot of like personal learning in that as well. It's like, 
you know, I don't need external success to be to be happy, to be satisfied. The process is enough. The process of inquiry is satisfying in itself. So there's there's a there's that um, sort of higher level, if you like, like thinking, higher being, big brain thinking. But um, in terms of what I do to get rid of my frustration, I clock off and I go and take a dance class. <laughs> like I just you know, if you can't solve the problem that day, you can't solve the problem that day. Um, the problem will be there for you the next day. Put a pin in it, do something very physical, sweat it out, come back with fresh eyes kind of thing. I love that. Uh, yeah, the, the, the problem is not necessarily going away. So it's sometimes you just need to attack it with a fresh set of eyes. I totally understand that. Chan, what about yourself? Do you um, find a little bit of frustration in what you do? Oh, yes, for sure. Since I started like the science journey, like even back in high school, my high school research project was like actually a fail. So, you know, there's there's a lot of failures along every single way, but you fail your way to success, you know, like my first PhD project here when I um, came over to Australia was also a fail in the sense that we tried to get a mouse model working and it wasn't working and we couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. So we spent a few, like, you know, we spent a while trying to figure out, trying to make it work before we decided in the interest of time and in the interest of uh, the resources that it's better to just switch tracks and try something else. And I think like when there's like those kind of disappointments, those kind of frustrations, yeah, it's going to be disappointing and it's going to be frustrating. But you can also kind of um, take a look at it as an opportunity to try something else and do something new and see how that works. And even now, I still have data that I look at and I'm like, I'm not quite sure why this is happening. And this doesn't really make sense with what everyone else has been saying. So sometimes you look at your data and then you critically analyze it in the sense that, okay, is it something I'm doing wrong? Is it something the field is doing wrong? Most likely it's something I did wrong. And then it's like, ah, I missed a decimal point. No wonder everything is like a hundred times what it should be, huh? Um, but you know, it's that kind of being able to critically look at what's happening and then reaching a conclusion that you are satisfied with yourself instead of like what everyone else may say. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the theme I've sort of got from both of your answers is the um, learn, learn to be happy with, within yourself rather than getting an external validation because it, it may not come. Um, you, you may not be able to just flip the newspaper upside down to get the answer kind of situation. Uh, so we've got another question that's come in from our audience and it says, um, what do you think kids in school now will work on in your particular areas in the future? Do you want to go first, Tian, or? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So there's there's a few things. I have my fingers in a few pots. So I think in terms of kids in the future, I'm seeing more and more of like that kind of um, cross, what was, what's the word? Essentially doing multiple things at the same time and then merging them all into one thing. There is a word for it. I forgot it. Um, but essentially... I think in terms of the research, there will be hopefully more research coming out. So if there are more people interested, um, they can also start go going after whatever I have done. They can go expand on it a little bit more. In terms of the like business commercialization things, there's a lot of entrepreneurs coming out, even in undergrad, even in high school, but also later on in life as well. Like after you have done so many years of research, you finally have that one drug or one cure to something. And that is also a long commercialization process that you can be involved in. And then in terms of the music stuff, enjoy it. Enjoy the music, enjoy uh, whatever you can create, your creative outlets, be kind of, you know, be free with what happens. Fantastic. What, what about your thoughts on this topic, Beatrice? Yeah, it's uh, 
It's a really, like, it's a very interesting question. Um, and, you know, something that you, you've sort of got to take stock of, like, you you know, like, all the people you talk to and, like, your science career and, you know, where you project it to go. Um, I guess in my field of, like, drug discovery, I'd say, like, probably machine learning and algorithms to, like, better design drugs I, I think I think you know kids in school like you guys will be working on that in the future um there are some there are these and I think I think um doing things on a far far smaller scale and far more efficiently so like um making the processes of things so much greener and so much more efficient I reckon you know that's that's what you guys are going to tackle um yeah I think those are the two I think those are the two main things as to where my field is headed at the moment that's that's very exciting because I guess I, I guess if, if you think about it from a field progression way like what what the two of you do now um may not have even be thought possible 10 years ago like if, if you think of kind of the the cycle so the the students who are in high school now are kind of doing the research in yeah about 10-ish years so yeah that's that's super exciting to to see how things can how things can change and uh the future of your your relevant industries that's excellent um, so a question for both of you that I've got is um, you've both worked um, in various fields, doing various experiments, various different things. Um, what's the most interesting thing you've worked on? I'll give you a little bit of time to think because I know when you, you know, when you do cool chemical experiments every day, um, you may not be able to narrow it down. But I'll start with Beatrice. Yeah, this is sort of like asking someone what your favorite, you know, who's your favorite pet or who's your favorite child? Like, <laughs> it's really difficult to narrow down. Um, let's see, what was the most interesting? I guess the most, I, I, I'm going to be a bit, a bit boring. Oh, actually, no, what I did during my honors year, I think was the most like most interesting slash fulfilling. So um, I worked on a protein called HIV integrase, which is part of the, um, you know, basically how the HIV virus replicates and gets propagated. Um, and that was that project was really interesting to me because it was so multidisciplinary. So um, I got to work with um, a company from the UK called Vinalis that, you know, had this proprietary um, uh, like workflow that um, we got to capitalize off. Uh, and there was also a bit of uh, biophysics, which is basic, specifically the area of biophysics that I was using was a, a technique called x-ray crystallography. And that's how you visualize a protein. So you shoot x-ray beams at a crystallized bit of protein, and you're able to see how it exists in three dimensions and how things bind to it. Um, and it was really cool for me to, A, design compounds that would bind to that protein, um, make them, test them, and then see them actually bind to that protein. So I think, yeah, that was probably the highlight <laughs> for me. Yeah, look, even just explaining the the even just explaining the X-ray crystallization sounds really, really cool. So I can, yeah, and and um that that multidisciplinary um approach where you know you can get um advice and uh work with people from from different elements to kind of solve the one problem, I think is super cool too. What about you, Chan? What's the most interesting or or even surprising thing that you've worked on? I think this is such a hard question for me. Like as Beatrice said, it's like, who is your favorite child? And I'm like, all of them. But um, one of my highlights would have to be the few months I spent in Finland, just looking after research calves because I did have animal, like research animal experience, but that was with a much smaller scale mice. 
like that could fit in the palm of my hand and halves are born weighing as much as I am. And like that, having that um, kind of research experience that is outside of a typical quote unquote lab setting, but it's still like research lab because um, a lot of the times agriculture doesn't seem to be like emphasized a lot, at least in my undergraduate studies, probably because of the courses I was taking was more like basic science focused. And in terms of the models that they use in basic science research, cows are not one of them. But um, the information that we were trying to get from the calves was something related to like how gut microbiota works, particularly when you're, um, um, particularly how milk from mothers can transmit information to calves. And we wanted to see whether or not that also impacted the gut microbiota, like can the gut microbiota from mothers also get transmitted to calves? And those kind of research questions have implications not only on humans, but also on like how we have our food as well. So I thought it was really interesting to just see a like a whole new side of research, but also this was in Finland where the sun doesn't set ever. Like I had blackout curtains because it would be sunny in the middle of the night, that kind of a thing. So it was really, really an, an experience, I think. Yeah, that sounds it. Um, I I would struggle if the sun didn't set and try and trying to regulate your your circadian rhythms and all that sort of stuff. That would be super duper hard. Um, actually, I have a question for you, Chan. You kind of you've touched on it a few times about how your um, science, not necessarily your research, but your curiosity and your um, STEM career has taken you all over the world. Um, you know, Finland, England, places like that, and now obviously here in Australia, um, was was the fact that STEM could take you anywhere something that really interested you and sort of made you pursue a STEM career? Yeah, that is also one of the factors, actually. So I did mention about one of my friends, but also one of the reasons why I applied to Australia was because it is sunnier than Canada. Canada snows from like October to May, and sometimes the wind hurts your face. And I'm like, I don't want to live in a place where the wind hurts my face. I want to experience something new, you know? So the fact that um, I was able to pursue like a PhD, like, yes, I am still a student, but um, what most people might not know about PhDs is that you are still paid to do a PhD, like, especially if you get um, a scholarship. So most universities will pay PhD students to do the research that you're doing. And I think that was one of the key draws that drew me to Australia because the pay was also slightly higher than Canadian pay. So yeah, there's the pay, there's the weather, there's the research projects and yeah, the ability to kind of quote unquote, follow your dreams in a sense. Yeah, I can also sort of comment on that as well. So one of the reasons I decided to to, like to to pursue the ph phd project that i did was the potential to travel <laughs> as well we had collaborators in north carolina and you know obviously this was this was sort of pre covid i was meant to go to north carolina for about a month to work with them um and that was sort of part of the reason i wanted to do that but also like more broadly, um, you are encouraged as a PhD student to go and present at conferences. These conferences are all around the world. And um, you know, when I say you're encouraged, there's financial incentives for you to do so. So, you know, I've presented in like Heidelberg, Germany, I've presented in um in San Diego. I am going to be presenting in Nice in a couple of weeks, actually. So, you know, like you, you really do just, just travel as a PhD student. It's something maybe that they don't tell you enough about. I think it's one of the greatest benefits. Yeah. Um, I can't think of too many other things I'd like to do more than go to Nice. <laughs> go, go to Europe right now and escape this Canberra winter, I think would be absolutely fantastic yeah. um so we probably have time for sort of one more question and I like to end these on a bit of sort of like a positive note um and it's what 
do you what do you enjoy I'm oh, no, sorry what bleh, excuse me not what do you enjoy but what is the best thing about what you do I know once again it's going to be it's it's the opposite of the what's your favorite it's like it it's exactly like the what's your favorite children question but if you were I, I guess I guess maybe to reframe it if you were to pitch to the students who are on the call today about and and to to get them to come and join your lab or join your exactly what you do what would be what would be your pitch to them I'll start with you Tan yeah sure uh Join my lab and join whatever else I do because it's a lot of fun and you get to have your fingers in a lot of different pies and you also get to experience just kind of anything that you're interested in. So if you're interested in music and research and commercialization, yay. It's just, you get the, you get a wider range of experiences. So, and you ne don't necessarily need to shut the door on any one of those, I think, yeah. That sounds fantastic. A little bit of, um, yeah, keeping all the options open and um, just because you're, yeah, if you're working in the commercialization space, you can still um, focus on your music and things like that. That sounds yeah. wonderful. Um, what about you, Beatrice? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I guess like for me, it's like, yeah, you can, you have, as Tian said, like a lot of fun, you know, this is all, this is like a, a an interest-based career you know um not you know not a lot of careers are like that you get to ask questions and then you get to follow them up like you know that's that's probably like you know the best thing for me um and like I guess um like a side note to that is that it's got real practical tangible results you can see you know like your compound binding to a protein in a cell and then maybe in a in a mouse model and then you know who knows maybe in a human that's pretty crazy to me that I like little old me gets to do stuff like that yeah that's that that's that's a wonderful wonderful thing to end on in that it it can be a little bit surprising and startling that in fact in your own special ways the two of you are kind of changing changing the world a little bit like um, you know, coming up with your proteins or um, finding out about bone health. Like it's, yeah, that's that. That's a wonderful, wonderfully inspiring thing to end on today. So um, that is all we have time for this morning. So uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And thank you to Beatrice and Tian who have shared their STEM career journeys with us this morning. Um, and special thanks to everyone else who has tuned in today. So Beyond the Lab is made possible thanks to IMNIS's major partner, MTP Connect, and it's part of the READY initiative, the Researcher Exchange and Development in Industry Program, a $32 million initiative, which has been made possible thanks to the Medical Research Future Fund. So uh, don't forget to fill out your feedback form after you have uh, leave this session. Uh, the Shape Your Future series will be continuing all year. Uh, so tune in to hear from many more uh, scientists. Um, all of the information is available on both the Stella and the ATSI websites. Thanks, everyone. And I hope everyone has a lovely week.